Good morning, afternoon. I don't know which way to go. Oh yeah, almost afternoon. Um, so thank you very much. And so what I'm gonna be able to do is present a study that we're working on that's really focused a little bit more than what others have been talking about on prosecutor-led diversion programs. Uh, we're in the middle of the study right now, um, so I'm gonna be able to um, focus on phase one findings, um, and everyone has to stay tuned, unfortunately, for the phase two findings. Um, so again, in, with these record-breaking caseloads and overburdened jail population, all of these things that we've been hearing about today, jurisdictions have tried to figure out alternative ways to make caseloads not even get to court. So what I'm focusing on is prosecutor-led. So this differs from police diversion programs. While a person may not even be arrested and the police are making a, de uh, a decision to divert them to either programs, services, and not even getting to the prosecutor lab. And this is different than court diversion. So after they've been arrested, after the prosecutor knows about the case, the court is making a decision to divert. I'm focusing on, in the middle there, the prosecutor-led diversion programs. Um, so it's an opportunity to reroute offenders. And sometimes it's always pre disposition, but it depends on the jurisdictions on whether it's pre or post filing. Um, it's, it's an opportunity to provide treatment or services. I can't believe some of you have been able to read that. Um, in lieu of prosecution for the defendants, and it's an opportunity to avoid stigma, collateral consequences, and all of the things that we've been hearing about. Prosecutor-led diversion programs have been part of the legal landscape for since like the 1970s. And they've been studied extensively, especially in the 1970s. The problem is that although the research was rigorous, methodologi methodologically sound, um, the, the, there was no, you know, there was no clue, true conclusion on whether or not these programs work. And part of the reason is because the programs are completely different in jurisdictions all over the place. So we're funded by the NIJ, we're the Center for Court Innovation, RAND, and the Association for Prosecuting Attorneys. We got started January of 2013. It's about a three-year program. Like I said, we're right in the middle. Uh, so the phase one was to produce a rich understanding of, of existing programs nationwide. Uh, we're not trying to draw general conclusions. We just looked at 14 programs in 10 sites across the country. Phase two is to test these programs on whether or not they reduce recidivism, uh, incarceration, psychosocial problems, and cost, and we're gonna do a cost-benefit analysis as, as well. But again, I'm only presenting phase one. Uh, so, sorry, I know it's big, but I really wanted you to see that these are the 10 on the left-hand column, uh, the 10 prosecutor agencies that we were able to visit. The second column is all the program names, in case any of you are familiar with any of them. And what I also wanted to show here was that it is a mix of pre-file pre -file and post-file. And it's also a mix of charge severity. A lot of people think that these diversion programs are for low-level uh, offenders, but really we have a lot of felony offenders as well. And what type of charge they're focusing on is also different. Some are very, very focused on drug problems, prostitution, some of the diversion programs, but some of them are what the jurisdiction itself is um, kind of dealing with, uh, whether it be retail theft or you know whatever, whatever might be plaguing their community. So what we found was that recid reducing recidivism is not a commonly stated goal, which is fantastic. Um, it's more things like reducing the collateral consequences, providing treatment to address the underlying causes of crime, and to save money, use resources more efficiently. A lot of the times people would say, we want to uh, provide treatment to, under, you know, to address the underlying causes of crime so that they won't reoffend. So recidivism was kind of implicit, explicit oftentimes, but really they were trying to um, deal with these other goals on the forefront. Um, again, mix of pre-file, post-file. Um, in Vermont, uh, for instance, they don't want the court involved. So in, uh, so in Burlington, they said, well, of course, it has to be pre-file. We don't want the court anywhere near these cases. We don't want the thumb of the court. Um, we want, the prosecutor wants to have jurisdiction over these cases. But in Philadelphia, for instance, when we asked why are you doing a post-file and not pre-file, they said, well, how, we wouldn't even know about the cases. So it really kind of depends on how the jurisdictions can, can do it. Um, it's again not limited to low-level offenders and again most programs deal with a wide variety of crime But there were some targeted programs that we that we focused on But most programs exclude violent offenses history of violence sex offenses weapons and domestic violence just kind of as a general rule Treatment matching so half of the program use risk and needs assessment and in those cases that those results do inform the treatment or services that um, the defendants are getting. Um, all of the programs that specifically focus on drug issues, they do use an assessment. And from our you know, 
pretty intensive case studies that we're doing on them, they're actually using these assessments. So it's not as though they're just doing them and not actually using the scores, they are using them. Um, assessments covered reoffense, drug use addiction, criminal history, employment status, demographic, but less of the assessments that were being used were focused on antisocial personality, criminal thinking, um, past experiences of trauma, I don't think actually any of them did trauma, depression and or bipolar disorder. Um, a wide variety of services are being used in these programs. All of them are using community service. Um, but some, depending on the program, if they were more tailored to drug offenses or prostitution or retail theft, they had actual programs that the defendants had to go to. Those were the, that was their mandate. Um, most of the programs were educational. Uh, not very many had CBT or trauma-focused treatment. And in all cases, there was a large part of legal leverage. Successful completion led to cases completely being dismissed, uh, reduction of charges, or cases actually never being filed. And in most cases, an extra step could be taken to um, actually expunge the cases. And just in an evidence-based language here, uh, defendants did receive written information, so they were actually implementing the program like they said they were going to do in their policy manual. So like I said, there is a huge phase two now to this program, uh, to this study, I mean. The evaluability assessment is being conducted right now. So we looked at the 14 programs, and based on the basic questions on whether or not these programs can actually even be evaluated. Things like, are they actually interested in being evaluated? Do they have the data to be evaluated? Um, and we wanted to get a broad spectrum of different sizes of jurisdictions so we could generalize our findings. And we want to look at, um, jurisdictions that are focused on kind of all of the different crimes that plague a community, as well as programs that are really, really focused so that we can provide, um, you know, good research to help jurisdictions either implement these programs or learn from other jurisdictions. Um, so we're right now, we do have our four programs, but we're really trying to figure out their data capabilities. So, we, you know, we have to, it's gonna be, you know, either, it's gonna be a comparison in all cases. We're not gonna be able to do a randomized uh, trial. Um, and then again, there's an impact cost benefit and hopefully the uh, results will provide implications for criminal justice policy and practice. So thank you very much.